everyone welcome to the second session uh, of the quantum computing series of our boltzmann lecture series uh, our speaker today is sashank kaushik engineering physics sophomore from iit madras uh, over to you sashank yeah thanks vivan uh, good morning everyone thank you for waking up so early by quarantine standards uh, so i'm sashank uh, i'm an ep second year at uh, iitm and uh, today let's continue our earlier discussion on quantum computers and today we'll start looking at the hardware aspect uh, which i still like to call experimental quantum computing since it's still quite in the nascent stages in the early stages of its what what could be an illustrious career for such a technological development um a disclaimer before we begin uh most of the concepts here require a very good physics background to understand so it's to understand completely so it's natural to not be able to grasp everything i say in the first go but that being said i've highlighted the key points that you can probably note down and read up on later and i've also attached the references that i've used which are very which were important for me to be able to understand what was happening myself and uh today's main discussion will be about quantum computing hardware uh but i will mention other forms of quantum technology that have been developed in parallel and that seem to be a little more realizable in the near future in the short term and medium term future than say quantum computing itself and i've mentioned those in the end as well so first let's begin with a recap of the first session so we talked about the second quantum revolution the first quantum revolution being the advent of quantum mechanics itself in the early 1920s and through the course of the 19 uh, uh, sorry through the course of the 20th century the 1900s uh, so 1920s uh, we saw you know people like schrodinger heisenberg uh, eminent physicists of the time coming up with the theories and it was established till the 1970s and towards the 1980s we saw efforts towards controlling these systems and trying to gain control over the evolution trying to gain you know as much control over a quantum system at that scale as possible and till this date the second quantum revolution has been all about gaining control over quantum systems to try and see the possibilities for technology using this find this this or uh, control that we've achieved and quantum technology has seen so much advancement from the late 20th to the early 21st century is the it's, it's been a phenomenal achievement in quantum computation uh, as i had mentioned has seen so much development in multiple fields uh, and it's it's seen a lot of scope for being used in not just as a paradigm for information processing but it's also applicable to other fields and as such one must not treat quantum computing as a fad you know something like say bubble memories that came up early on uh, seemed to be a very big technological fad at the time and really never surfaced but quantum computing has to not be seen as a fad as such it is something much more fundamental than that because uh, it it aims at controlling quantum systems to the maximum capabilities possible and that is something that has been the goal of physicists for a very long time now and so as we had discussed you know the elementary units are qubit quantum bits they are essentially two level systems two level quantum systems that must obey the postulates of quantum mechanics that are superposition and entanglement and these qubits interfere with each other they provide a level of parallelism that cannot be seen in classical systems they can deal with amplification of probabilities of achieving particular states simultaneously why without having to cycle through multiple possibilities of states so yeah uh, i guess that's a good enough recap and let's go on with today's session content now having established all of the theory of a quantum computer you know it has to satisfy so and so properties it has to satisfy all these postulates is it even possible to build a quantum computer when all we've seen till now has been a classical computer or supercomputers even 
with uh, which have what we think are the maximum capabilities possible is it even possible to control aspects of a system that is so non intuitive to us that we've only heard of in pop popular science and theories like that well the answer to that is it is possible to build something like this but of course terms and conditions apply as always the first proof of concept of this that i'd like to mention is the stern gerlach experiment which was one of the earliest proofs of concept for quantum mechanics itself and for the property of spin of a quantum uh, entity and it was basically conducted with uh, earlier with silver atoms and then later on it was replicated with uh, hydrogen atoms uh, essentially you have a source of these atoms which is like a gun if you will and it shoots a beam of these particles uh, through a through a magnetic field that is directed uh, using very strong magnets uh, in a particular orientation and what you would expect classically is that you know atoms like hydrogen or silver for that matter are supposedly magnetically neutral right you don't expect them to behave like an iron magnet you don't uh, expect them to be attracted towards any magnet that you usually use however what you observe is that not only are they attracted in either direction by these magnets but they also split into two very distinct paths that are later on detected in a photographic plate or some some kind of a detector and these this this is the first indication that of something called spin which is basically a quantization of a basic magnetic dipole that is evident in these uh quantum systems uh and it's not just at the level of a silver atom or a hydrogen atom it is evident even for an electron this has been replicated with an electron gun and electrons split like this and they go and hit these two detectors at very distinct spatial points so it's an indication of quantization in at the level of a spin and this is one of the most fundamental aspects uh, fundamental proofs of the existence of quantum mechanics that is realizable in an experimental perspective i mean of course this is not enough to ju like just do this to realize a quantum computer itself you'd have to be able to couple it controllably you'd have to be able to reduce noise margins and two of the most major obstructions of progress of quantum computing lies in noise it can be both classical and quantum noise and the validity of quantum mechanics itself seems to be put to the test when all of these are being tested out coming to noise we talk about the theory of error correcting codes uh, which are used to remove quantum noise from a system and it states that below a particular noise threshold we can use these error correcting codes to push the noise margins down arbitrarily under broad assumptions about the nature of the system and these have been used very effectively however you know it comes at a small computational cost and it also comes at the cost of using a few extra qubits so to realize one logical qubit in a system the qubit that is used in theory that you use to realize you know these operations multiple log multiple physical qubits have to be implemented so that one may use these error correcting codes to implement one logical qubit and that is one slight drawback to the implementation of quantum computers nowadays because as you can as you probably see or read in articles quantum computers don't really have many qubits nowadays to actually be able to feasibly use quantum algorithms success, successfully and you know the one of the major drawbacks is the number of qubits and the number of physical qubits that are needed to implement one logical qubit so we have a long way to go but error correcting codes give us a lot of hope for mitigating this very very fundamental quantum noise that is inherent in a system and coming to the validity of quantum mechanics itself we want to see if quantum mechanics can be put to the test by controlling these quantum systems to the max and we want to see if we can discover phenomena that don't necessarily obey the laws of quantum mechanics you heard of such exotic phenomena such exotic states of matter like the bose einstein condensate and things like that which are achieved at such low temperatures and you know these are states of matter where you have such a bulk of material behaving as one quantum entity without you know the individual atoms themselves indicating unique properties 
so you know these come under the studies of condensed matter physics and fields uh, like that and discovering phenomena like these that don't uh, phenomena uh, that don't obey the laws of quantum mechanics could be as revolutionary a discovery as finding quantum mechanics itself and you know these are one of the key motivations for the field as well but so far none of this has been achieved yet uh, no quantum mechanical violations have been found yet so we have only been proceeding it, it's been such a successful theory so we've been proceeding under the presumptions that quantum mechanics is correct and that we will be using its postulates to try and push everything to the limit now the guiding principles of achieving a yeah sorry about that i think there was a connection issue uh i'll share my screen again Yeah, so I believe I left off at the guiding principles. So the guideline, the guiding principles are given by particular guidelines that have been given by uh, Professor David DiVincenzo, who has worked with IBM uh, in giving these principles, which are essentially rules for what a system must follow and how it must be so that it can be uh, a practical quantum computer and so that you can Uh, use it effectively to achieve certain operations that are desirable to a quantum computer so uh to start off we have to have a robust physical representation uh you have to have this system that obeys the physical model that we've built using quantum mechanics and it has to be robust in the sense that it has to be able to account for all sorts of physical phenomena that can occur with the system because we know that physically practically speaking systems don't always go according to plan there is always certain amounts of noise from outside so we need to be able to account for all of these and be able to describe our system accurately enough that we have control over what is happening to it and coming to the control over what's happening to it it must evolve in the desired manner we need to be able to perform these changes to the quantum system through gates that we've spoken about previously all of this evolution must be unitary uh these they are represented by unitary matrices for a closed system and as described it must evolve in a unitary fashion so that when we go from one state to another the other state is also achieved in uh reliably and we must be able to initialize these quantum computers reliably to a particular ground state because we have something called thermal noise that comes into play and these thermal fluctuations are of the order of you know kbt boltzmann's constant times the temperature which is at much higher energy level than the energy required for quantum transitions to happen and these quantum transitions are what we are using to go from one state to another so since these play such an important role uh, sometimes these thermal uh, the thermal equilibrium states are taken to be the ground states of that particular system but we need we need to make sure that these can be controlled as well so that we can initialize it reliably when we know that it is in the initial ground state that we need it to be in and uh, one of the most important things is we can't really do anything without read out of the system we need to be able to read out the measurements we need to be able to measure the final outputs using particular detectors that are designed for the purpose of specific kinds of qubits and we will we'll come to that as well and um, often times so there are certain other conditions that i'll be talking about in the next slide these are all derived from the famous de vincenzo criteria and often times only partially can these requirements be met by specific systems there are often uh, when we talk about the drawbacks of particular quantum systems over others uh, why we favor particular kinds of qubits over other qubits it is because one of these requirements are not effectively met by that particular qubit so the question shouldn't be how do we build a quantum computer it's how good a quantum computer can be built how can we test the limits of these uh, postulates for particular quantum computer uh, architectures and how well can we achieve these uh, these how how well can these principles be followed 
So the conditions uh, for a quantum computer are that they must satisfy the mentioned requirement. And potentially good candidates have something called a long decoherence time. Uh, I had spoken about quantum noise. So decoherence will be dealt with in the next slide. So it's essentially a source of quantum noise in a system. And a metric of a good qubit is a long decoherence time and a short operation time. So if we can implement these gates in a very short amount of time, in the order of say microseconds or nanoseconds, versus the decoherence time, which can go from large ranges depending on the qubit architecture, uh, take it to be that the decoherence time is the time till which the qubit is useful. Beyond that, we can't use the qubit properly until you know we reinitialize it or something like that. We can't perform continuous operations on that particular qubit. So the decoherence time is sort of a limiting factor and the operation time should be short so that we can cram in as many of these operations. You know, the number of operations is given by the decoherence time TQ divided by the operation time T op. It's, it's sort of a good metric to decide whether the qubit is good. So we want to maximize this number of operations. And no system is a perfect two level quantum system. You can't have a system with just two quantum levels, there are definitely other uh, energy levels of the system. An atom itself has, I'm sure some of you would have learned about quantum numbers. You know, you have the principal quantum number, which is the orbit transitions of an atom. And beyond that, you have orbital quantum numbers, which this define the orbital transitions, uh, degeneracies of these levels, and the degeneracy can be broken under certain conditions to further split the levels into these orbital levels. And you can, this is called the fine splitting. And then there is even Can't hear you, so Oh, sorry about that. I think I was muted. Uh, yeah, am I audible now? Yeah, works. Okay. Right, so it's been a major hurdle for quantum system control over the last few decades. And, you know, we've been trying to deal with it as much as possible using error correcting codes and other mechanisms and trying to achieve perfect control. But uh, dealing with this is not just the problem of dealing with quantum noise, it's also about understanding the interaction of a, close, of a quantum system with its environment. So generally, you model a quantum system as a closed quantum system, you know, the Schrodinger equation and all of that describes the evolution, the unitary evolution of a closed quantum system. However, when you have interactions with the environment, it behaves as an open quantum system and it doesn't just obey the Schrodinger equation anymore. You have to talk about certain other master equations that govern the dynamics of the system. And even if we don't know the perfect information about the environment that it is interacting with, we can, under certain assumptions, describe this evolution using uh, certain assumptions like the Markovian assumption that the state of a system is only defined by what it was in an infinitesimal time before. So that is the Markovian assumption and there are certain equations that you can use, like the Lindblad equation, to describe the evolution of the system under these conditions. And it's as though these systems are entangling with the environment and this entanglement causes a super selection of states. So we know that entanglement gives some sort of a correlation with the state, with the system that it's entangling with. And this correlation leads to the system that it's entangling with choosing only particular states. So we can't really control what the environment does, but based on what the environment does, our system reacts accordingly and starts to decay. So decoherence is a sort of decay to a particular state. It's a really, really important phenomenon because you have to see how it bridges the quantum classical gap that exists. There is this gap that we see. We don't observe quantum mechanical phenomena around us macroscopically, uh, and there's a reason for that being decoherence. Decoherence seems to be the reason why classical phenomena are what are observed in macroscopic entities and not quantum phenomena, because at such a large scale, decoherence plays a huge role, and the coherence times of all of these objects are so small that by the time we observe them, they are not quantum anymore. They only exhibit certain states due to this 
entanglement with the environment it's it's a very nascent field but it's been it's being a hot topic for research nowadays and you lose all of this quantum information to the environment and quantum coherence preservation is done using error correcting code so i i really you know suggest that you guys read up on this because this is such an interesting topic you know it brings into uh, the fold so many interesting topics of physics even chaos theory uh, theory of dynamical systems and quantum chaos is is being used as one of the explanations of sorts for decoherence and it's a beautiful field to think about so let's come to the crux of this talk which is what are the candidate quantum systems that are available to us for qubit architectures so there are so many candidates right now because it's such a new field uh, experimentalists are trying to experiment with so many different kinds of systems however i'll be talking about certain qubit architectures that are very reliable seem to be very reliable at least as of now and that have been implemented into chips and quantum computers that have performed certain algorithms uh, you might have seen google's quantum supremacy uh, claims and ibm's quantum computers so all of these will be mentioned and spoken about here so a disclaimer that we can't cover all such candidates there will be some of you who would be thinking what about these systems what about those systems and i will mention them towards the end uh because essentially any quantum system can be treated as a qubit if you just ignore the other levels and you you try to as i said there are certain properties of unwanted transitions however if these transitions can be minimized then you can essentially treat any quantum system as a qubit however as mentioned practicality is necessary and i will try to mention the related qubits uh, along the way so to start off we have optical photon qubits or photonic qubits which are uh, very very attractive physical systems for quantum devices in general not just quantum computers but other kinds of quantum technologies because they link the framework of quantum computers and quantum communication often times you require moving quantum channels of information so that you can transmit this quantum information from one system to another right that is also you want to be able to preserve your state so that you can transfer it as is using quantum teleportation protocols and things like that and you want to be able to transfer it between one quantum computer to another and one of the major drawbacks with other kinds of systems is that you would have to hybridize particular architectures of these systems because not all kinds of qubits can be moved from one place to another so you optical photon qubits are one such candidate that can be easily linking quantum computing and quantum communication through optical fiber networks and things like that a lot of the operations that are done use standard interferometric techniques now if any of you are familiar with interferometry uh you would know that you use beam splitters you use phase changers you use wave plates and wave guides and these are very standard optical equipment and optical components that are used and these are the same very same components that you use as gates in optical photon qubits you know these are chargeless and they don't really have strong interactions with each other or even most matter which is really important because when whenever you have strong interactions it's really hard to control we have to do a lot of studies and you have to be able to control these systems as is and be able to couple them at will and this coupling at will is not really going to happen very easily with strong interactions and as mentioned you can have optical fibers as your cables to guide these photons long distances without you know much loss of coherency and you can manipulate them using linear and nonlinear optical components as i said interferometry uses all of these components very frequently and the best part is that these photonic components can often be integrated into silicon chips so you can fabricate these chips which is a technology that has been used for decades now to build quantum uh, to build normal computer chips and the same technology can be leveraged to build photonic chips and you can build silicon based photonic chips very easily so that you can scalability is a very a uh, big advantage here and you can manipulate single qubits of photonic qubits using linear and nonlinear optical components and you can couple them using nonlinear components like kerr media so kerr 
the Kerr effect is a nonlinear effect wherein you can couple two photons uh, through uh, cross phase modulation. And these, one of the sort of drawbacks of this is that nonlinearities are difficult to implement. However, there have been, you know, uh, advances in this using something called the linear optical quantum computing model, which is which uses something called the KLM protocol. Again, something you can read up on uh, to completely use only linear components to achieve these nonlinear models. And to summarize about photonic qubits, you can see a photonic chip over here uh, developed by some Chinese scientists, and these are. Uh, so the qubit representation is using the location of a single photon between two spatial modes uh, or, you, or using the polarization of the photon. The unitary evolution is using arbitrary transformations that can be constructed from phase shifters, which are optical components, and beam splitters, which are also optical components, and also nonlinear curve media. The initial state preparation is just by creating single photon states. This is something that is very fundamentally done in quantum optics. Uh, creation of single photon states. You have single photon sources, which are another very important quantum technology that have been developed using semiconductor devices. And you can also create them by attenuating laser light so that the average photon number of that state is one. It can even go less than one. That's a topic for another discussion. Um, the readout of this uh, photonic qubit is done by detecting single photons using either photomultiplier tubes, or uh, I think I misspelled that there, using photomultiplier tubes, or even avalanche photodiodes, which essentially generate a photocurrent upon detection. And these photocurrents can be used to gauge whether the photon was detected or not. Now, the drawbacks, as mentioned, with the nonlinear Kerr media with you know low Absorption loss are difficult to realize, and these nonlinear effects in general are not very easy to realize practically. So, we have to look at certain other kinds of models. Linear optical quantum computing is one sort of a nascent model that seems to have a lot of promise for this. However, there are other kinds of qubits which can also be used to maneuver through this. So, optical cavity quantum electrodynamics QED is quantum electrodynamics, and cavity QED qubits are one particular kind of qubits which are developed on the basis of these photonic qubits. They're very similar. However, you start to treat light in a cavity. So you have these cavities such as the fabry perot cavity. Again, these are used very frequently in interferometry as well. Uh, however, cavity, uh, building these cavities is a very standard, you know, practice of engineering using photonics and it's, it's something that we've known how to do for a while. Uh, and we also know that light in a cavity acts like a quantum simple harmonic oscillator. Meaning, uh, no, you know a uh, harmonic oscillator classically is like a mass on a spring or something like that. And the energy spectrum is continuous. However, when you quantize it, it becomes a discretized spectrum of particular energy levels. And some of you who might have studied in, in chemistry or in spectroscopy might know that the energy splitting of a simple harmonic oscillator in a quantum regime uh, it splits as h omega uh, times n plus half, where n is the energy level quantum number of that harmonic oscillator. However, as you can see, it scales linearly with the integer number of the level, the quantum number. So each level is spaced equally. So when you go from one to two or two to three, the energy gap is the same essentially. So you will have to provide a particular photon uh, of the same energy uh, of, of a resonant frequency would give transitions maybe from one to two and maybe this transition can go from two to three or three to four and so on and so forth. So you can't really control that uh, the light in that cavity exists only in the states one and two. It can keep going on. And the only way to control this is if you can introduce an unequal spacing between these levels. And this can be done using, uh, by introducing a single atom into the cavity. And this light matter interaction is what will change the level spacing. And this change in level spacing is all that is necessary to prevent these forbidden, these un unwanted transitions from occurring. So when you have uh, an atom inside the cavity, these levels are not equally spaced anymore, and you can 
try and tune the frequency of the controlled pulses so that you can induce only the transitions that are necessary to you. And you know it's it's similar to the optical photon qubit, but now you can store the state locally in the coupled cavity. You know you can't really store a photon unless you know you have a cavity to do that for you. And when you have a cavity, as I said, this SHO principle you know renders it impossible to manipulate it properly. However, with these cavities, you can store the photons in one place. You can couple them effectively, and you don't need um, yeah, so you can couple them effectively. You don't need a lot of optical fiber cables to you know direct the photons properly. Or coupling can be done using you know microwave pulses and things like that. So it's very very important advancement in the field of quantum computing is the building of cavity QED qubits. Uh, you can do unitary transformations on the photons before they enter the cavity, so that when they enter the cavity, it's reflected on the atoms as well. So it's as though the the photon and the atom are entangled and they share the state among each other and you can store the state of the photon using the atom inside the cavity. Now the coupling can be done using photons but it's difficult to do when there are stronger photon atom interactions as I said it's hard to control but in principle yes you can couple them and a popular architecture nowadays uses so-called artificial atoms where you can control this interaction and these artificial atoms are often in the form of superconducting circuits that are used as resonators to create this behavior and to create. Because all you really need are the energy level interactions and these energy level splittings need not come from an atom alone. That is of course a natural source. However, our control of quantum systems has advanced to a stage where we can actually build artificial atoms using these superconducting circuits. And the next will be superconducting qubits. These are of course the popular choice of architecture among IBM and Google's quantum computers. You would have heard of them and read about them in multiple uh, articles and probably not would have understood much about them because they are quite complicated. However, I can say that they are pretty well controlled in the current scenario uh, and they are reliable and there are there has been much research into this field. That being said, there is still a lot more to be done. However, it seems to be a reliable candidate. So it's studied in the field of circuit QED, which is circuit quantum electrodynamics. And what you have is you have a resonator that is very reminiscent of your simple LC oscillator that you might see. And in this case, you can write the energy of that oscillator as a Q squared by two plus phi squared by two, where you have Q squared by two uh, with again with certain constants, uh, but you see that Q square by two is your charge in the circuit, and phi square is the magnetic flux through the circuit, and these are what you call canonically conjugate variables, and which are really really important because these are what give you the mathematical framework for quantizing a particular system. A classical system can be quantized using these canonically conjugate variables. So superconducting circuits are essentially quantized LC oscillators with these quantized levels and so they do behave like these quantized simple harmonic oscillators and you can control them in such a way that these level spacings are not equal. They are unequal so that you can specify the two levels and to get into a further technical details, they're made up of Josephson junctions which is a, a junction is basically a thin tunnel barrier in between two superconducting nanowires as I can show you here. If you see here, these junctions that you see here are uh, these junctions that you see here are the qubits. These are the Josephson junctions that are implemented here and here. And these resonators are what couple the qubits to one another and apply entanglement to them. While these resonators come from the microwave sources for applying quantum gates to the qubit and also reading them out. So the readout is generally done using microwave cavities as uh, I talked about cavities before are really, really important to physics. And microwave cavities have particular resonant peaks that are shifted slightly when you want to, uh, when coupled to these qubits at particular states. And the shift in the resonance peak is used to measure the state that the qubits are in. So yeah, just to summarize, the studied in the field of circuit QED, superconducting circuits can act like quantized LC oscillators. And they're easy to couple using these resonators, either using capacitors, which are fixed couplings, 
uh, which have a fixed coupling strength or DC squids. Squids are a kind of magnetometer that is used extensively in the fields of magnetic sensing and they provide a controllable uh, coupling that can be used between two qubits. One of the slight, one of the drawbacks of these in terms of scalability is that they involve very large dilution refrigerators and cryogenic setups to cool them to superconducting temperatures. Superconductors so far have not been achieved in room temperature for sure. They are achieved at low temperatures. Even high temperature superconductors are actually very low temperatures for us. And superconducting temperatures are quite low and you'd require large dilution refrigerators to achieve them. As you can see, in this particular picture. This is an IBM Q quantum computer. It's quite large. It's a large setup. It's many feet in, in height. And you can see it's a very complicated setup. But most of this is just the dilution refrigerator. The bottom half consists mainly of the microwave setup. And the central part here is the chip. So as spoken about before, qubit representation can be represent by, represented by either of the phase charge or flux states. The charge and the flux are the canonically conjugate variables here, while it can also be represented with the phase. Now, phase, phase being the phase of the current in the superconducting circuit. Now, unitary evolution, it can be controlled by these microwave pulses as seen through these wires here. And they can control the phase rotations, R, Y, R, Z rotations of the particular qubit. The initial state preparation is through thermal initialization, as I'd mentioned, sometimes you would need thermal initialization. However, it can be controlled as well. So this is one uh, key aspect here is that thermal initialization can be controlled by controlling the temperature of these systems as well. So it's a dual benefit. And qubit specific readout mechanisms exist for you know different kinds of phase, charge, or flux kind of qubits. Uh, there are different kinds of transmon qubits and fluxonium qubits. You can definitely read up on those. However, the general idea is you have a microwave cavity and you measure the change in the resonance peak of the cavity to measure the state itself. And the drawback is that you require dilution temperatures uh, to cool, dilution refrigerators and so to cool for, a, uh, for the operation of these qubits. Trapped ion qubits are another very popular uh, architecture that are used by IBM themselves. They themselves are doing research in this as well. And uh, I think University of Maryland is also a key uh, research group that is doing research on these trapped ion qubits. Now, these don't really create artificial atoms, but they use ions, a bunch of ions trapped in this electromagnetic trap here uh, that you know keep them in place and you can cool them. So uh, you essentially have this theoretical uh, drawback of not being able to confine any atom or ion in an electromagnetic trap using just static fields. They have to use RF fields. This comes under Earnshaw theorem, which is a very popular theorem of electromagnetism, which states that you can only trap these ions electromagnetically under dynamic fields. So these are done using RF fields. And uh, you can induce this so-called hyperfine splitting by inducing a magnetic field. So these usually degenerate levels are split into an up state and a down state in the hyperfine splitting. And you can limit the degrees of freedom of this ions using something called Doppler cooling. And you would have heard of something called laser cooling, which is essentially the same thing. You apply lasers in particular directions so that you are limiting the degrees of freedom of this. Usually when you talk about lasers, you think it's exciting a system. However, sure, it is limiting the degrees of freedom of the system. So the dynamics are defined by the hyperfine transitions as well as the motional mode. So you have something called phonon, which are quantizations of the motional modes of a particular system. And they are quantizations of heat, essentially. And the decay to the ground state through spontaneous emissions, which seems to be a drawback. Uh, you, they emit a photon and they decay to the ground state spontaneously. You cannot predict when this happens. And this is, again, a key feature of quantum mechanics itself. So these can also be integrated into chips like these. Uh, this has been done at the National Institute for Standards uh, of uh, for, for Science and Technology in the US. You have uh, this particular electromagnetic trap 
which is actually quite often used in atomic and molecular physics studies. And you can also use them here to build these quantum computers. So the hyperfine state, uh, uh, nuclear spin states of an atom, which are essentially gotten from the spin-spin coupling, and uh, the lowest level vibrational modes or phonons of the trapped atom. These are used as the coupling mechanisms as well as the qubit representation. So you use these phonons to induce phononic coupling between two uh, ions in these traps. Now, unitary evolution can be done by arbitrary uh, applications of laser pulses, which externally manipulate the atomic state, and the qubits interact, as I said, via phononic coupling. The initial state preparation can be done by cooling these atoms and doing something called optical pumping. So there are certain non-radiative transitions of these that follow certain rules, selection rules uh, as they're called, and initialize these particular uh, states. So when you excite them and when they come back to the ground state, they follow these non-radiative paths that only come back to particular spin states, either the zero state. So it is selective. It's not thermal in the sense that it is not a statistical mixture of these different spin states. It particularly pumps them to these particular states. And this is one very useful mechanism to initialize them, which is also seen in a lot of spin architectures, which we will talk about later, into their motional ground states and hyperfine ground states. So the readout is by measuring the population of these hyperfine states, which is done very uh, reliably using atomic spectroscopy techniques. And uh, the phonon lifetimes are short, and the ions are difficult to prepare in these motional ground states as seen as drawbacks in atomic physics as well. However, it is a promising candidate, and there have been a lot of developments in this. Just uh, it, it is sort of like a competitor to the superconducting architecture. So the next architecture we'll talk about is NMR qubits. Now, people thought, why not try to confine molecules so that you know these molecules and their nuclear spins can be confined using these traps and you can couple different nuclei in that molecule to each other within that so that one molecule can act as a quantum computer on its own. And this was not seen to be too feasible. So instead they chose this, uh, the uh, approach of making solutions, liquid or solid solutions of these molecules so that you can try to manipulate the nuclear spins using the solutions and using NMR spectroscopy techniques, which are very, very widely used in spectrochemistry. So the principles are around the same. You use strong magnetic fields, you split the degenerate levels into separate levels, giving you the zero and one states of these qubits. And then you use these nuclear spins uh, to move them from the zero state to the one state. And this change in these spins are done using uh, again, RF or microwave pulses, and you can do readout using optical detection and NMR spectroscopy techniques. You have an NMR spectrometers, uh, uh, which are devices used to read out the spectrum of these particular molecules. And the modeling is pretty robust in terms of how much it has developed over the last few years. Before the superconducting architectures and all of these came about, NMR qubits were what were used by IBM in their initial demonstrations of quantum algorithms and they are they do face their own issues in terms of scalability which seems to be a particular issue here however the modeling can be extended to study other types of qubits called spin qubits which are very very uh, good uh, candidates for quantum systems which are being studied extensively there they can be silicon spin qubits or even nv centers of dimes we'll talk about them after this so the qubit representation here is the spin state of individual nuclei of a solution of molecules. So you have coupling already. You have coupling between these bonds that are formed between these molecules, and you don't necessarily have to induce this coupling, but you can control them uh, using these NMR techniques. And each spin can be addressed by applying a radio frequency pulse with its resonance frequency, and you can refocus for removing unwanted interactions, which is a really, really important. Refocusing is a really important uh, aspect of NMR systems. You can polarize the spins by placing them in the strong magnetic field. So you can also use this effective pure state preparation 
technique which is uh, specified in certain texts of, and literature and you can polarize them and you can initialize them to just the zero state or just the one state using again you can leverage the thermal uh, noise as well in this case to try and initialize them uh, to the desired states. Readout is done by measuring the voltage signal induced by the processing magnetic moments. This is again done using these NMR spectrometers. Again, very standard devices used in physics and chemistry. Uh, the drawback is scaling. So scaling seems to be the issue here because poor scaling of signal to noise ratio as the system itself scales in the number of qubits, uh, so which presents an issue of lack of scalability. So we've discussed a lot of standard quantum computing architectures and these are very widely being researched. Uh, we will also talk about some other kinds of architectures. Oh, sorry, before that, let me just try to explain what this essentially is. So this is uh, an implementation of the MQFC, the measurement based quantum feedback control protocol, which is uh, done using these NMR samples, wherein you try to take the output Based on the output, you implement a sort of feedback mechanism where you can control the field that is generated in these pulse generators. And then you try to control them using these algorithms like the GRAPE algorithm, which is a, a pulse optimization algorithm that is used very widely in even other fields of engineering uh, disciplines and things like that. So GRAPE and optimal control seem to be the goal in NMR quantum computer. Now, further candidate systems, uh, as I said, these are only some of the possible candidates that have been researched slightly more extensively than other systems. And it's evident from the fact that there are so many candidates still available to us that the field is still young. There, there's a lot to be done here. And some of the uh, specific qubits that I've mentioned are silicon quantum dots, which seem to be very advantageous for uh, scalability due to the well-known fabrication techniques. Uh, silicon quantum dots essentially uh, use electrons in these solid state structures which are confined to these particular potential wells. And these potential wells allow us to isolate these electrons very well and use simple voltages at particular electrodes to try and control the spins and uh, of these electric dipoles. Now, NV centers are nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds. So you would have, you, I'm sure a lot of you are uh, familiar with the tetrahedral structures and geometries of diamonds. Oftentimes you see certain defects in these diamonds wherein a carbon atom is replaced by a nitrogen atom and a vacancy. This vacancy is often negatively charged which has an electron in it. And this electron can act as a spin qubit. You have a splitting of states. It's a spin one system and not a spin zero, a spin half system. But you have a zero state, a minus one state and a plus one state. And you can choose which two states you want to use to act as a qubit. And these are shown to have very long coherence times even at room temperatures. And you can use them even as quantum repeaters in a quantum communications network. This is actually being researched. It's part of a research group in our uh, campus itself. And you can even use them as nodes in a quantum network. And this is being actively researched in a group by a group in TU Delft in the Netherlands. Again, very, very interesting things. Uh, one of the drawbacks of these systems are that you can't really couple them really easily. Uh, but again, everything has its drawbacks. This is one of the drawbacks of NV centers, uh, which is also being researched. Now, topological qubits are sort of like these exotic qubits that are being researched by Microsoft and other groups in Tube Delft as well. And it's essentially, you have these Majorana bound states, which are quasi particles. They are not particles that have been observed in nature yet, but they've been theorized by um, the, the scientist, Italian scientist Majorana. And they're, because they're quasi particles and not actual particles, so you, they, you, give, you, you can attain these uh, Majorana bound states when you have a superconductor uh, which has particular pairs of electrons and holes. These electron hole pairs can essentially act as Majorana bound states when physically separated from each other. Again, the physics here is quite advanced, uh, but the key point here is that because they are quasi particles, they are virtually resistant to any kind of noise. 
by virtue of their creation, by virtue of their existence as these Majorana bound states, they are virtually resistant to noise because they are protected by certain symmetries in these energies. When physically separated, they, they, they are coupled with each other, these Majorana bound states, and they do not uh, they do not vary due to noise independent of each other. They are dependent on each other and because of that they are resistant to noise. Now, there are other kinds of exotic models of quantum computers using Bose-Einstein condensates and optical lattice based qubit types which are really, really new and are being actively researched in the field right now. And there is also a lot of research, as I said, so some of these qubits have certain drawbacks that are compensated by other kinds of qubits. So there's a lot of research in trying to build hybrid architectures, you know, coupling superconducting qubits and trapped ion qubits or superconducting and NMR based qubits and you know, so on and so forth. So a lot of the research is focused on hybridizing these qubit types, but scalability seems to be an issue even there. The coherence is still an issue and a lot of issues to be taken care of, but that is where we lie right now. So I'd like to wrap up by talking about uh, you know, all of the architectures that we've spoken about have been specific to quantum computers so far. However, other quantum technologies are also defining traits and seem to be short term and medium term uh, realities in the second quantum revolution and have already been implemented in a lot of cases. So one of these is adiabatic quantum computers. Now, companies like D-Wave are working on building quantum computers that don't necessarily follow the gate level digital quantum computer systems. They follow something called quantum annealing, which is essentially this form of continuous optimization of particular quantum systems. And these are done again using artificial atoms using superconducting circuits. You can read up on these as well. Another candidate for these kind of uh, problems is coherent icing machines. So these machines are essentially used for quantum simulation. You want to study quantum systems at lower temperatures to see the behavior of these systems that you cannot see in room temperature. And they're very, very important. And they abide by the principle stated by Richard Feynman that you cannot simulate a quantum system using a classical computer. And you would require a system which is quantum in nature itself. And that is exactly what these kind of uh, quantum computers uh, aim to achieve. So coherent ISM machines are often also called optical neural networks. So I, I, I urge you machine learning enthusiasts to read up on that as well. So they're quantum optical neural networks. They can act as nodes and build a neural network. In fact, I think there are efforts uh, being made in this direction, even in our campus right now, to build a coherent ISM machine. So I urge you all to read up on this very exciting topic. And atomic clocks have been a standard for measuring time, of course, uh, with a large, large accuracy of even you know, nanoseconds or pic picoseconds. And uh, atomic clocks seem to be the way to go to increase accuracy further. And this, uh, this technology is very, very related to you know, ion traps and things like that. And ultra cold atoms are another uh, field of study for quantum simulation, wherein you have certain kinds of atoms called Rydberg atoms or quantum gases, Fermi unitary gases. You have Rydberg atoms basically are atoms where you have uh, your principal quantum number n of a particular atom being very, very, very large so that you can observe what kind of evolution happens at these highly excited states to kind of simulate certain kinds of quantum behavior. Again, very active field of research here. Quantum sensors are a very active field of research in terms of nitrogen vacancy centers and spin uh, systems being very sensitive to changes, small, small changes in magnetic fields. And they've even been used in, gra in gravitometers uh, and in detecting gravitational waves using these small changes in magnetic fields. And they've been used in interferometry studies as well. Um, quantum communications and quantum key distribution systems seem to be becoming a reality day after day. They are very, very uh, useful because they are theoretically unhackable because you cannot measure a system without collapsing the wave function and losing all that information. So essentially when you try to hack into the system, you are disrupting the state and you are killing whatever information you're trying to extract from it. And this quantum communication protocols and quantum key distribution has given rise to a lot of 
advancements in the field of single photon sources and uh, avalanche photodiode detectors and the kind of photonic systems that are being integrated into chips are very very useful and a related field uh, is quantum random number generators and quantum random number generators are trying to generate pure random numbers and not pseudo random numbers that are generated by software and uh, algorithms nowadays because you want to be able to keep your system as secure as possible and it relies heavily on generating random keys for securing your data and these random keys must be random for perfect security and quantum random number generators are a key aspect of that so some references that i've used for this talk have been quantum computation and quantum information one of the best textbooks i know for uh, quantum computing by Nielsen and Chuang. And another source I used was IBM.com's quantum computing blogs and IBM Q's uh, uh, details about their quantum computers. I also referred to the DiVincenzo criteria from his physical implementation of quantum computation paper published in 2000. Uh, I urge you to look that up as well. And also QTech Academy lecture series available on YouTube, uh, a very insightful uh, resource to understand the physical implementation of different kinds of chips. So yeah, that comes to the end of this quantum computing series. I hope you all learned a lot more than you knew yesterday uh, about this very vast and interesting nascent field of quantum computing. And I hope I could convey some information to all of you through this. And yeah, let's move on to the questions.